all. Let's open up our Bibles, if you brought them to the, today, to the book of Genesis. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 1. Uh, in verse number 28 here in a minute. So we're in a series entitled Summer Reading. And out of that, uh, we're talking about books that I have read and I enjoy that I encourage you to read this summer. I know summer is a time for a lot of people to do some reading, uh, which is good. Uh, maybe if you're going on a little trip, you need something to kind of digest and read. And this is what this series is all about. I personally try to read 21 pages a day. Um, now, obviously, I read a lot more than that for my job, but just for myself personally, uh, how many of you know you should work harder on yourself than you do even your job? You should work hard on the job, but you should work hard on yourself. Uh, so I read 21 pages a day uh, to work on me. Uh, some, some books that just bring life to me or bring me into the knowledge of things that I might not know about or strength and beliefs that I have. Somebody says, why 21 pages a day? Because I have found that if you read 21 pages a day, you can read almost any book a week. Uh, and so one book a week is kind of what I shoot for. And these are some of the books that I've read that have impacted me. And many of these books I read uh, every single year. One of those books we gave away last week to everyone who took the Thai Challenge. We had close to 450 people sign up for the Thai Challenge, which is amazing. Uh, welcome to this world of generosity, uh, no matter what campus you're watching from. And I pray that book, uh, Fields of Gold by Andy Stanley, just blesses you and strengthens your faith while you go on this journey. Journey. Uh, this week, I'm talking about a book that forever changed my life, and I was so thankful to be able to meet the author and tell them that before they went home to be with the Lord. But it was a book entitled Releasing Your Potential by Miles Monroe. Uh, and I love Brother Miles. I go back and I listen to his teachings a lot. I read his books a lot, but this was one that just changed my life. Uh, so many of you probably know my story, but my father passed away at 17. Uh, from 17 to about 19, God began to rebuild me. I felt like my life had kind of fallen apart, and God was picking up those pieces. And when your life falls apart and God begins to pick up those pieces, you'll know that he is by one key characteristic. You know what it is? You'll begin dreaming again. When you are functional, when you are working the way that you should, you are filled with visions and dreams. Uh, faith sees what could be. Vision sees what is. Uh, the just shall live by faith. Uh, and so if your heart is functioning well and it's rebuilt and it's working, it means you're filled with what could be, filled with vision and filled with dream. And there's a joy about you and an excitement about you because you're not maintaining the present. You are creating the future. Come on, somebody. Uh, so out of that, I began to dream. And I'm thinking, when I go back and take over that church, how awesome is it going to be? We're going to build a building on Lakeland Drive and, you know, all of these kinds of things. Well, one thing you have to know is that whenever you decide to become a dreamer and these dreams and visions are birthed in your heart, the enemy will come for that. Uh, Mark 4 teaches us this, that when God sows something into your heart, and once again, the Holy Spirit's language, according to the book of Acts, is the language of visions and dreams. Now, don't get super spiritual and think about like in prayer, seeing a vision or going to sleep and having a dream. It's just something comes up in your heart. And you're seeing what could be. And uh, imagination is working the way God intended it to work. And it's creating like this future. And there's this joy based off what you're seeing. Uh, and so these things begin to work in my heart. And I begin to picture these things. But any time you get in a place where that is happening, according to Mark 4, the enemy will come for that. Any time you make a decision... Uh, to have God speak to your heart, a vision or a dream, the enemy will come for that, and he comes for that vision. He comes for that dream. And so as soon as I began to like, I'm going to live out my dreams, immediately everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Nothing worked the way that I thought it would. Uh, tests and trials arose for the word's sake, uh, to kind of use Mark chapter 4. And uh, all of these dreams of like, this must be done in my life, and this is something I was incredibly excited about, turned into didn't have tos. Why well, don't have to? Um, you know, this is okay, and an unholy contentment began to enter in my soul. Now, there is a holy contentment, and holy contentment is you decide not to delay joy for a future season of life. Uh, that you learn in the middle of all things to count it all joy. That is holy contentment. But there is an unholy contentment uh, that makes you maintain the present 
versus creating the future. In essence, instead of trying to create, and how many of you know, uh, you're made in the image and likeness of God the Father, you know what he is? A creator. Uh, And so instead of trying to create a greater world, which is what God is doing when he made you in his image and likeness, instead of trying to create a greater world, you're trying to maintain and not lose the one you have. And all of these must and dreams, ah, I don't have to. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. And I'm in this stage where, you know, we were on Highway 18 at the time, uh, and I still would love to plan a campus somewhere in that area at some point, uh, and because that area is still in my heart. But we were over on that side of town, and we had bought this land on Lakeland Drive, and my father and mother had put in the parking lot, and this was just a pad, and, uh, you know, all a uh, pad for, for building. And uh, I thought, you know, I don't have to do that. I can sell it. And there were many opportunities to sell it. I could sell it. I could do all these things. And I, I'm here trying to, like, keep our facility on Highway 18. I'm not trying to build build anything. I'm not trying to envision anything. I'm not dreaming about a better future. And two, two years before this, filled with what God could do. So excited about what God could do. And now it's like, well, you know, this is fine. And we'll just kind of keep it this way. And God had to wake me up from that. And one of the things he used to wake me up from that was this book by Miles Monroe, Releasing Your Potential. And uh, the book starts out with this, this point. Uh, in the forward of the book, it talks about the first and the forgotten commandment. Uh, Now, how many of you know God's never given a suggestion a day of his life? Uh, So if God's speaking to you, I'm just going to help you now. He's not asking. (laughs) So it's not a suggestion. Uh, If God is asking you or coming to you and telling you to do something, he is giving a commandment. And we're very mindful of like the Ten Commandments, but there is a commandment that uh, Miles talks about that is the first commandment, but it's also the one that is forgotten. And it's found in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 28. They'll put it on the screens, and you can also read it in your your Bibles. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Subdue the earth. And rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every other living thing that moves on the earth. Now now notice this. Uh, Take the earth and subdue it. Bring it under control. So here you see God's first commandment. He's like, take this, the heart of man, uh, dreams, vision, desire. uh, Take this and let it overcome this. Let it subdue it and let it create. Uh, So don't just see the tree in the garden. Create a house. Build a chair. Uh, unleash your visions and dreams using this creation that I have made you. I'm not going to just hand you everything. Create. And how do you create? Off of desire, off of dreams. Go out there and, and, and create a life, like subdue the earth. Now, this is the commandment of God, but once again, Satan will come for that word. And so instead of us subduing all of this, what happens is, is life begins to subdue this. And this out here begins to tell me what I can't have, what I can't do, uh, what I shouldn't do, the limitations that I have. And so instead of this coming under my heart's control, this is controlling my heart. Instead of my dreams forming and framing a world, the world is forming and framing my dreams, and it begins to shrink. And I think so many of you are at that place right now where it's like, I don't have to. And before, you were so excited of, like, what you could do and what you could be. And this is kind of graduation season. Can we give it up for all the graduates, whether it's high school or college? Amazing. Uh, So you're in that season of life where you're dreaming. Uh, But so many of us know that when we were in that season of life, uh, over time, we have this phrase of, like, life happens. And that just simply means of, like, things out here begin to tame and control the desires and dreams that were in here. And we let it. And God's commandment was not let this control this. God's commandment was let your heart subdue the earth. Uh, Go and and take it and make it into something more. So Miles put this in his book, and it really woke me up. Uh, He said this, everything that God made was designed to produce more than what you see. 
everything that God made was designed to produce more than what you see. And so you see a tree, and many of you, when you exit and you kind of walk around, you'll see a tree. Uh, Think of all the things that people saw come out of those trees. Uh, You know, there's some people who came and saw the tree. They saw a desk and took the tree and made it into a desk. I went to to Bible school with this guy who was, like, amazing with a chainsaw. A little scary. Because I'm like, how do you? Well, never mind. But anyway, he could take, like, a stump. He would cut down trees, take the stump, and, like, build, like, bears out of it. Uh, Like, so I'm seeing a tree. He sees a bear. And sure enough, he would, with this chainsaw, kind of make this happen. Uh, So he saw something within that tree. Uh, Years ago and still today, there are people who see boats in those trees. Uh, There's so much that can come out of what you see within every egg, you know, chicken egg that's laid in a chicken coop. It's more than what it is. A chicken can come out of that, and out of a chicken can come another chicken. Because everything that God made was designed to multiply. Everything that God made was designed to reproduce. And everything that God made was designed to be something more than what you see. And so out of that, it takes someone seeing what could be in the tree to get the most out of a tree, but a tree could be so much more than what it is. And how many of you know every tree started with what? A seed. And when you think about this, I've got some watermelon seeds up here. How many of you are thankful for watermelons? Oh, my goodness. I had one this past week. I kid you not. It made my tongue want to slap my brains out. Uh, This thing was perfection. I mean, in every sense of the word, perfection. I went out and bought two more. Uh, That's true. But out of this, uh, it's amazing that we see something so big uh, come out of something so small. This is a watermelon seed. And in this is trapped potential. God made this. But what you see here can be more than what you see. That in this is something that brings joy. In this is something that brings nourishment. In this is something that that brings something so delicious. I'm talking about it on a Sunday. Um, In this, there is so much more in here. And we know that, and many of you know that, which is why you take these seeds and you plant them, because you believe that there is more in this than what you see, so you're willing to pay the price, get it in the right environment, Wait for it, not give up on it, not uproot it, wait for it, and know that if you give God the right environment and enough time, something great can come out of something so small. And why is it that we have more faith in this little seed than we have in ourselves? Uh, that we live in a world where literally buildings have come out of men and women, like, like literally microphones and creativity and speakers and chairs and art and poems and songs and music. Uh, you know, think about Maverick City and some of those songs that we're singing. Here. What has come out of the human spirit? Uh, all the technology that's in your phones, uh, you, you know, right there, like it was designed and came out of a man uh, and a woman. They sat down and they thought about it and created it and formed and fashioned it and it blessed and enriched our world just like the watermelon seed. Why is it that we can see this coming out of seeds and other people, but we can't see greatness coming out of ourselves? <laughs> I think we live in a world where, like that watermelon seed, it could look at all these other watermelons and be like, man, that's big and impressive. Like, it it could look at all these other trees and vines and think, man, that's so amazing. And we live in a world that so lacks an identity that it can be great that we will wear Jordans and let another man's image and greatness be on us. And there is nothing wrong with with Michael Jordan becoming all that God made Michael Jordan to be. But we lack so much identity in ourselves that we try to find identity in everything and everyone else, which is how brands are created in the first place. And I'm just fascinated by this idea of what can come out of you fascinated by this idea that you are more than what you have become. 
And I think like that watermelon seed looking without itself and seeing all of these other vines and all of these other melons and all of these other trees. And I can imagine it just like fighting to get in line to get the autograph of another tree. <laughs> fighting to like get a selfie. So it could post like on whatever, you know, like if Seeds did create a social media follower. Like, look who I got a selfie with. Greatness. Look at this melon. I'm just a seed. That I wonder if it was out there and it was forming and fashioning its life, how so many times it could stand next to a melon or stand next to another tree and just feel so insignificant. To chase it. Get a picture with it. Read about it. Study it. And I wonder if that seed, instead of looking without itself and outside of itself, if it began to look within itself at all the trap potential that was in it, and if it just made a decision to release something that could bring joy and nourishment to our hearts and lives, something that would enrich our tables make our lives sweeter, so much it could give to us if it just saw the potential within itself. And I, I think about all the people who, who we have who will watch and listen to this, and we, we, we live in a culture that just marvels at all the other trees and melons and sees what everybody else is doing, more so now than ever before. We can see what they're doing in India. We can see what they're doing in California. We can see what they're doing on vacation. We can see all of these other lies, and we can daydream and think of, what if I had that, or what if I could be that? And all this while of looking without ourselves, that we could just turn that attention within ourselves and find that within us there is a God who is capable of doing exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or think according to the power, get this, according to the power that works within you. That within you there is this potential. Within you there is so much more than what you are giving us. That within you there is the ability to create. That in you there are songs and music and art and books and teaching. That in you there are businesses and there are, are you know, cells that, that could build an orphanage. And in you there's like all this potential to like speak life and pray. And some of you have the gift of prophecy. That in you there are things that you could give the world that unlocks something in somebody else. And gifts of leadership and gifts of management. That in you, you come in and take a company higher. In you, there's favor on you, Joseph. Just get with Pharaoh. You can save a whole nation. That in us, there is so much more than what we are giving to this world. Within the seed, there is trap potential. And within you, there is trap potential. I'm reading this book at like 20 years old, and I'm, I'm going through it, and all of a sudden, the more I'm reading it, the more I'm realizing like all of these unique desires really are unique to me. That there are things that God did send me here to this earth, that I was not just born, I was sent to this planet. Uh, that in me was, was things that needed to be done and things that needed to be built and things that needed to be accomplished and things that needed to be uh, um, uh, put in the earth and messages that needed to be preached and lives that needed to be prayed for, that in me there was so much more. And one of the big, you know, like it's the first domino, but one of the big things is me seeing that. And believing that in me something could come out of it. And I think so many people, they don't have that element. And they literally craft a dream based off of comfort and survival instead of significance and greatness. And one of the things that like Miles speaks so heavily on in his book, and it's such a great point is this, is that for you to pursue greatness is not prideful. For you not to pursue greatness is completely irresponsible. What if every tree decided, nope, you're not getting a boat out of me. I'm just a little old tree. Nothing good can come out of me. Uh, what, if, what if the tree said, you know what, today we're not giving the world any oxygen. They don't really need it. They don't need me to release my greatness. They don't really need to me to convert this stuff over into stuff that they can breathe. They don't really need it. What if every fish said, you know what, the world doesn't really need me. We don't know no purpose in reproducing. What if every bee said, you know what, they don't really use honey. What if every grain of wheat said, you know what, they, they don't need me to like become more. 
What if it just said, you know, like, there's nothing within me I need to release? How it would completely, like, devalue our world and come to a place where we're all in need if everything stopped producing and releasing its potential. And I think about how much better our churches could be, how much better the kingdom of God would be, how much, how much greater the Lord's kingdom and world would be if every believer believed I was sent here by God to give the world something. And I'm going to find what that is. I'm going to get in the right environment. And I'm going to give the world what God has given me. I'm going to release my potential. In 2014, I had the chance to, to meet Miles, um, and we had just built uh, uh, phase one here at uh, our Lakeland campus, and um, just had released that building, and um, out of that, uh, people started inviting me to preach uh, in other places and teach in other arenas and that kind of thing, and I got invited to this business meeting uh, where Miles Monroe was the keynote speaker, and it was a couple of weeks before he passed away. And uh, I had the chance to meet him, and I actually had to preach before him uh, and preach with him on the front row, which was very intimidating uh, to have this uh, hero of mine, um, you know, there and definitely felt like a seed compared to a watermelon, (laughs) that kind of thing. Uh, But I, I did my best to do what God asked me to do in that meeting. And after it, I walk in the speaker's room, and Miles Monroe walked up to me. He's very short. <laughs> like, I'm like, you look taller on stage. Uh, I didn't say that, uh, but I did think it. Uh, but anyway, he walked up to me, and he shook my hand and said, that was a great message. And then he took his finger, and he poked it. Like, he didn't just point it. He poked it in my chest, and he said, who are you? And I said, well, my, my name's Joel Sims, and, like, I'm so intimidated <laughs> Uh, I tell him my whole story. Like, my father passed away when I was 17, took over the church. Uh, You know, from there, I actually read your book. And in your book, I decided to, like, release my potential. And out of that, we built a facility. And my father passed away on April 17, 2001. And we actually opened up the facility on April 17, 2011, 10 years to the day. Can you believe that? Like, I'm going over all these kinds of things. And finally, I just run out of words, and his finger's still in my chest, and he's like, that's great, but who are you? I'm like, my name's Joel Sims. <laughs> All these things, and he stopped me, and he said, Joel, everything you've just told me is in your past. Is that all there is, or is there more in there? And I looked at him, and I said, there's more. He grabbed me by the arm and said, tell me about it. I sat down at a table and told him about this. Told him about what I saw my life doing. And everything that he made me talk about was not what was behind me, but was rather out in front of me. Oh, come on, church. How many of you know there's more in front of you than there is behind you? There's more that God has in your future than what you've seen in your past. And if you are still alive, God is not done getting something out of you. There's got to be something you bring to this world other than just taking its oxygen. Like, uh, you're not just called here to take up space. You're called to add value. It's not prideful for you to go after that. It's irresponsible for you not to. We need you to show us the best version of you. We need you to pursue greatness in you. We need you to get in shape spiritually, mentally, and physically. We we need you to be your best. We need you to be disciplined. We need you to be refined. We need you to be a leader. We need you to stand out. We need you to create. We need everything you have in you to come out of you. We need you. I was so thankful I had that that moment. It was the beginning of of a life for me in 2014 where I began to see uh, that there was still yet more in me. And I think about that conversation a lot, especially as I was reading uh, the the book this week, uh, that there is more in me, more to do and more to release for God's kingdom, to refine my life and to go after it. He talks about in, in the book that as long as the seed is in the wrong environment, 
potential remains trapped. That in order for the seed to produce the potential of what is in it, it must first get in the right environment. Uh, in Mark chapter 6, we see Jesus going to his own hometown. I encourage you to read this when you get home. For those of you who may be listening to this later by podcast, I encourage you to pull out your Bibles and read it now. Uh, but in Mark chapter 6, we see Jesus go into his own hometown. And when he goes into his own hometown, the Bible says that he could there do no mighty work, save that he lay hands on a few sick people and healed them. It didn't say he wouldn't, it said he couldn't. Because the environment of doubt and unbelief in him limited what he could be in that environment. There were other environments that, that Jesus got in that were filled with faith that released more of Jesus. And that environment released that potential. That just like the environment of the soul releases the potential of the seed, the right environment in your life releases the potential in you. That you will never release your fullest potential until you change the environment that you live in. And so Miles in his book said four things that make up our environment. Number one, who you live with. Number two, who you keep company with. Number three, where you spend your time. And number four, what you feed your mind. I've been reading a lot of studies with this one, who you live around, uh, because I, I really feel a part of my releasing my potential is doing something really special within our state and in our city uh, and releasing uh, a lot of things on a socioeconomic level uh, within our city, and that begins with what we're looking to do in Poindexter and the facility that we have there, but that's just the beginning, uh, is most definitely not the end. Um, and, and out of that, uh, kind of looking at some of those things, the number one predictor of like life change with children is the neighborhood they grow up in. This was amazing. I read this article like two weeks ago that all of us as parents are like, they're spending much too, too much time on the iPad. Or like all these kinds of things that we kind of freak out about and try to course correct. And they said some of these things statistically are important. But they said the number one predictor of where people will be in their future is the neighborhood they live in. And the thing that they looked at was how many college degrees were in the neighborhood and how many fathers were there. Isn't that interesting? And so they literally uh, pr produced this study where you can pull up the whole United States of America and kind of dive into places uh, that just per percentage produce greater things. Uh, and out of this, it just dived into it to see what can we do to turn some of these areas into places that are different and, and changing the environments of schools and changing the environments of neighborhoods and all of these other types of things is very interesting. But I know intrinsically, like my greatest competitive advantage in life was growing up with parents who constantly told me I was special. Like, literally, I believed ever since I was a little guy that I was special. Like, there was something in me that needed to come out of me. Joel, we named you Joel Nathan because of two prophets in the Old Testament. Joel means Jehovah is the Lord. Like, you're going to proclaim Jehovah. Like, that got in me. Uh, and it didn't just get in me. They were pulling what was in me out of me. And we have to be in these, these arenas of life where we are focused on who we are around. Are we around people who make us want to be better people? Are we around people that are bringing out the best of us instead of bringing out the worst of us? Are we really around people who are calling out greatness from us and, and drawing us up higher and showing us what we could be? Miles Monroe's who sit us down and make us talk about the future, make us answer questions about what we see and where we want to go and what God has put on our hearts. We need that. Our children need that. Our people need that. And I want to encourage you to find that in your life. Get around people. One of the things me and my wife do all the time is talk about what's next, what's next, what's next. When I'm with my team, I make them talk about the future. Where do we want to go? Uh, how are we going to get there? Let's pray for that. Pray for where we want. You need that in your life. I want to encourage you to go on a journey to find that. And for so many of you, like if you say, I don't have that and never had that, then maybe instead of growing up believing you were special, you were growing up believing you were not the smart one or not disciplined. You can't use that as your excuse. You have to come into a relationship with your heavenly father and let him tell you who you are. 
You have to draw near to him in worship and the Holy Spirit will give you a vision and a dream. It's his language. He'll make us dream. He'll make us see what could be. He'll put something in our hearts and it's always bigger than ourselves. That's why we need a God. And fellowship with him. But then that takes us to, to these things where you spend your time and what you feed your mind. I, I love what Paul wrote uh, to Timothy here. It was his son in the faith. And we need a new generation of spiritual father, fathers and mothers who will like come and believe in this next generation. Tell them who they can be. But watch what he does here to his son in the faith. He says, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, and faith, and purity. Show yourself to be an example to those who believe. He keeps going here, until I come, give attendance to public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift. Notice, where is it? It's within you. Don't neglect this thing which is in you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Here you see, like, like impartation from other people, who you're around, who you live with, this impartation coming into the lives of people. He says, Timothy, you have more in you than what you are giving us. And for so many of us, there is more in you than what you are giving us. And he said, I need you to know it's there. And what I'm trying to tell you today is it's there. There is more in you than what you even have shown up to this point. And so he encourages them, don't look down on yourself and don't let others look down on you. He said, give attention to these things. Don't neglect the spiritual gift, verse 15. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident unto all. He said, Timothy, basically you should come into a place where you should be able to tell anybody in your life who hasn't seen you in a year, let me reintroduce myself. Because the man you see today has improved from the man you knew a year ago. Uh, so if it's been a year since we met, let me introduce myself. Uh, because who I am today is not who I was. I have grown. I've gotten better. I've studied. I've prayed. I've meditated. And he said, Timothy, if you think this is going to come in your life without pain, you got another thing coming. You're going to have to trade some entertainment for some wisdom. And you're going to have to choose wisdom before entertainment. You're going to have to come to a place, Timothy, where you choose growth over comfort. You're going to have to come into a place, Timothy, where you choose prayer before conversation. You're going to have to come into a place where you value instruction even before you make your decisions. Where you choose the word before you choose the world. Where you choose Jesus before you choose everything. And he says, Timothy, if you can do these things, your, your profiting, your potential will be released unto all. And I want to encourage you today to spend enough time with the Holy Spirit and to enough time with people of the Spirit where grace is called out of you, and gifts are called out of you, and you begin to believe in yourself that there is more. In fact, today during our prayer times at the end of service at all of our campuses, I want to invite you like, to come down to the altar. If you need Presbyterian, that just simply means uh, elders in the church and members of our prayer team to just speak blessing over you. Uh, and maybe it does get prophetic and they cause something out of you. But no, uh, if you're there and you need that, take advantage of that. But when you leave this place today and, and you leave our, our sanctuaries, you exit. You have to go to work on releasing what is in you. And I know for all of us, work doesn't sound fun, <laughs> but I encourage you. You need me at my best. You need me to be disciplined. You, you need me to really go to work on me because there are things in me that I know that when they're released will bless a community, will help a neighborhood, will come and be produced. But just like you need me to go to work on me, I need you to go to work on you. I need you to go to work on you. I need you to do the things that you need to do. Give the wisdom that you need to give. Send out the podcast you need to send out. Write the books you need to write. Paint the art God's called you to paint. Uh, pray for the people God's told you to pray for. We need you to fight for the potential that is in you. Today, we want to close in song.
what do I always sing? Let's just make a decision uh, to go to work, to see the potential that is within us and to fight to bring it out. Let's rob the grave, and when we exit this planet, let's die like Jesus. Let's die empty with everything God placed inside of us left on this earth and not taken with us to the next side. Let's stand our feet at all of our campuses. Father, we come before you. We love you. We honor you. We thank you, Father, that we will fight to go to work on ourselves, that we will discipline ourselves and take pains to release the potential that is within us. And, Father, we thank you that as we worship and as we we come into a place of meditation and song, uh, that, Father, your Holy Spirit just speaks to us a vision and a dream, uh, that your Holy Spirit just begins to unlock something in us that we need to run our race that maybe it's a dream that's rekindled or maybe it's a new desire given, but whatever it may be, Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit knows what it is in my life and in the lives of each and every person here. And Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit begins to show us what these things are. We love you, Father, so much. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.